Hi, everybody. I uh, hope you had a chance to meet your five people so far today. Uh, if you haven't, uh, we've got this session, then another session, and then a happy hour, and you should be able to make up your numbers during the happy hour. Uh, we're going to talk in the next uh, few minutes about uh, improving your machine learning predictions using graph algorithms. If you're using uh, uh, machine learning and you have Neo4j, this is something you can get going with today. Um, quick reference again to the, the book. Uh, it is uh, out there for free. You can also download it. Um, it's particularly uh, important for this session or relevant to this session because we uh, basically use chapter eight to focus on machine learning and the workflow that we're gonna go through, the sample example we're gonna go through, uh, is pretty much what we did in the, in the book. Obviously, the book has a lot more detail. If you enjoy this presentation, if this is something that you would like to do, definitely take a look uh, at the book and you can get the code there, uh, code online as well and, and run your own experiments. Um, I am bringing out my co-author here again. Um, he did a lot of work on this chapter, uh, Mini Mark. Uh, real co-author is uh, Mark Needham, couldn't be here. Uh, but it uh, did a lot of work. We uh, actually had to rewrite this chapter once. Um, I'm glad it was just once. Uh, but uh, so a lot of effort went into that. Um, this morning, Emil talked a little bit about James Fowler's book, Connected. It's an excellent book. Um, you heard the example about smoking uh, and voting and the fact that your friends and even the friends of your friends uh, can be more predictive as to whether you vote or not than actually knowing some demographic information about you. Uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted to give you something else, kind of play on this a little bit more. There's actually been some more recent books uh, that also talk about how relationships are also predictive of success. Uh, two books that I, I've enjoyed is A Friend of a Friend by David Burkus, a really a great way to introduce the idea of uh, predictive elements and your net and network science without using the word network science, more about how to find your first job, how to find VC funding, how to use your network. Uh, and then Barabashi's book, The Formula. Uh, Barabashi is extremely well known in the network science, he usually does uh, space, he usually does very technical material. In this book, he kind of goes from the, the network science technical stuff and offers up uh, advice for being successful in life and your careers and projects. So not just predictive of behavior, but also predictive of success. And so if we know these things, these things called relationships and connections are predictive, why aren't we using them in our machine learning today? We can help you get more out of your data with the information and the data that you already have. And that's because, as we talked about this morning, current graph data so science models often ignore that topology. Graphs can add more predictive features to what you're doing already. And there are otherwise unattainable predictions that you can use. You can kind of get those mini hops out. You can understand what a community looks like. And so we're gonna focus in this session on connected features that we talked about this morning. Quick reminder, connected features are new features and uh, feature engineering, I should say, are new features, more predictive, meaningful features that you might be able to get out of your data. Uh, you extract those to put them into a format that you can use in machine learning, um, such as scores and numeric values. Um, what we did uh, in, this, uh, in this chapter is to do some link prediction, but I wanted to first share with you a machine learning workflow and a little, a, little more, a little more detail. And this workflow is something you could basically pop in and out whatever tools you might already be using. So of course you have to get your data together and store it as a graph. You have to aggregate, um, you have to kind of uh, do some, some cleansing and get it in a format you need. Um, next, you're going to do your next. You're going to do your cleansing and your your exploration, and also do modification. You might look at your data, explore it, and figure out there's some uninteresting or sparse areas that you just you want to get rid of. Maybe you have some outliers that would skew your information. Um, you also this is also the phase where you normally do feature engineering and extraction. Uh, then you're going to need prep for machine learning. This is a train test split of data. We'll talk about that in a minute. A resampling for meaningful representation, uh, looking for proportional data representation. Uh, then you're going to train your model as well. And I should mention that these are not always straight lines. That arrow kind of shows that. that sometimes you have to iterate. Uh, you're also going to do uh, model selection, uh, variable selection. You're probably going to use some ensemble of, of methods as well to train. 
Uh, and then you're going to evaluate results and probably start that iteration process again, uh, probably using maybe a subject matter expert. Uh, maybe you're just looking at your ROC curve, which we'll show later, um, and then pr uh, productionize as well. And that, those phases um, are never, <laughs> it's never a straight line, actually. Uh, you're always iterating and going back and tuning and tweaking your model. So an example using machine learning for pr uh, link prediction, um, first we should kind of just remind people what we mean by link prediction. Usually the idea is, uh, can I infer that there is going to be a relationship in the, in the future or estimate that? Or can, is there some, some unobservable fact that I don't know about? And an example of that, actually, there was an interesting paper about using link prediction in criminal networks to analyze uh, possible connections that they were pretty sure were there, but the data wasn't, wasn't there yet, and so that they could then target um, potential relationships. Um, so, so some really, you know, trying to kind of look forward. There's a couple methods for link prediction. One is to just simply use uh, algorithms and the, the measures. So uh, there's a couple we're going to talk about, uh, you know, centrality, uh, similarity, uh, link prediction itself, community detection. Those can just be used and you can set up a threshold. If the value is above a threshold, you predict a link. If it's below a threshold, you, you predict there isn't one. Uh, but also, you could use machine learning, and you can take those measures and then do lean learning on those measures to train your model, and that's actually um, the approach that we took. So we were trying to predict collaboration uh, in the future, and that's kind of an interesting thing, is what, you know, what people are going to work together in the future that we, we don't know about yet. Uh, so we use a citation network. It's um, a uh, network you can just search on uh, Arnett Miner and uh, find this, but it's a good paper, uh, and you can find information about the, the, um, the data. It uses research data set from, from various different sources. We used a subset of that data, and so if people cited each other, we assumed it's a co-authorship, and there's a relationship called co-author, and, uh, and then if they do it repeatedly, we also um, uh, look at that. We use Neo4j to create that co-authorship graph, and uh, do the feature engineering, and then we use Spark and ML uh, Lib to do our train and uh, test of that. Um, we actually looked at, we developed four different models with multiple graph features. Uh, there were many algorithms that we took at, looked at, and that's what I meant by trial, trial and error. So the, the thing to note when you're looking at uh, testing algorithms and building your, your model, a lot of people want to know, well, which algorithm do I choose to find this? It, the answer is it, it just depends, who knows, you've got to test it out and, and try it. You can, there's some general guidelines if you're looking for communities, you know, obviously community detection is, is, is a good one to start with, but the, you really just have to go through. In fact, uh, there was a, a couple things we were trying to, uh, to test out and we just couldn't get them to be predictive. Um, so it's just a matter of, of trial and error in that. Um, the four different models, uh, first we just did a really simple one attribute or one algorithm uh, looking at common uh, authors or common neighbors. Uh, then we started adding in more graphy features, looking at how many connections in common, how many neighbors in common. Then we started adding in um, things like clustering coefficient or cl uh, clustering coefficient and triangle counting, trying to look more at uh, more complex relationships. And then we added in community uh, detections as well. We've got label propagation and Louvain modularity as well. So we had four different methods or th four different models to test. You might be testing uh, many more. Uh, but then we went and did a, a test train split of our data. Now, why, why would you want to do that? Um, if we both tested or if we both trained and tested on the same data set and the same data, I, you can imagine my results would just be through the roof. I, I, you know, if I didn't get 100%, there'd probably an error in the code somewhere. Um, so basically, in, for all machine learning, you want to do a train test split. Uh, and a common method of doing that is actually just to randomly do it and to arbitrarily do it. And so in this example, uh, my train is blue, my uh, test is gray, and I want you to think about an arbitrary split on a graphy model or a graph uh, data set. So, Couple columns here, I've got common neighbors and preferential attachment. Let's, let's just look at common neighbors. So first node, second node, uh, first row, I've got a one and a two. So my node number one, my node number two, common neighbors, they have four common neighbors. That's in my train set. 
Now let's look at, where is two again? Okay, two about halfway down. Uh, we've got uh, two and 12 node. Let me see, I can make this easier for you guys. Two and 12, they also have some common neighbors, but two is here and two is here and some common neighbors. There may be common neighbors here that are also here. So can anybody guess what happened the first time we ran this? All right, we got unbelievably good results <laughs> because we were cheating. So especially if you're doing multiple measures that may have some common element, and remember this is graph, everything's connected. So you have to really think about how you're testing and training. Um, this is referred to as data leakage. Um, I like to refer to it as cheating because I have some of the answers in both my test and my training. Um, but you have, to, you have to think about that with, um, with graphs. And the, a really good way to get around that uh, and the, what we use is actually just to do a time split. So what we did is we looked at just first co-authorship and didn't look at some of the, the later co-authorship, and then we split by time frame. And so what that allowed us to do is to have two different graphs that weren't contaminating each other that we were able to then test and train on. Uh, and this kind of, the, the picture actually might lead to the next problem that we ran across. We always were running across problems. <laughs> uh, it's class imbalance. So I'm trying to predict collaboration. There's more examples of non-collaboration in our data than collaboration, and that kind of makes sense because you can imagine of all the people you know in the room already, you've already met, and all the people you haven't met, my guess is you haven't met more people than you've met. Yeah, I think I said that right. <laughs> so class imbalance can actually also lead to a really high accuracy model. So in this case, um, so, so you might just predict everything didn't have a link and you'd have a lot of accuracy. I, I actually really like this picture because if I was trying to classify or try to predict whether in this data set I had a blue fish or a red fish, I'd just predict blue all the time. And I'd be, what, 90 whatever percent, maybe not 90, but I, I might be 90% accurate. And, and, but I would never find the red fish. Uh, so you have to balance your, um, your set as well. There are two general methods for doing that, a downsampling and upsampling. Uh, both of them have uh, pros and cons. We chose downsampling. Uh, but what you do, uh, the con of downsampling, is that you do have the potential to lose predictive information because you're basically removing predictive uh, information or you're removing information in, to, in order to get your balance. Upsampling, um, the, uh, the issue with upsampling is that you might be training your model on uh, one of the results. So you're basically, you duplicate the data you have, which means you're training on duplicate data, which uh, potentially could overfit and influence your overall um, results. So next we, we went through and actually trained the model. Um, we use a random forest binary classifier on that. And this is just one decision tree. If you're not familiar with random forests and decision trees, they're really not that complicated. Um, if you can think of this as a decision tree, it's pretty simple. Uh, step one, uh, does the node have more uh, common authors than 1.5? Uh, is what's the, uh, you know, what's the, the um, impurity on that? I get either go true or false. Uh, node two says, hey, uh, common authors, is it uh, below 2.5? And you just step through the logic. But this is one tree and you have another tree that does something similar, and you have another tree and another tree, and they all come to a final decision, a final classification, link, no link, it makes its prediction, and then there's a, a voting at the end. How many, uh, how many pluses, how many minuses, uh, how many zeros, how many ones, and then you, um, then you come to a consensus. So when we trained our model, we used pretty common um, evaluations, common measures for it. This is our first result. Um, just a, a quick primer, if you're not familiar with it, on the x-axis, it's probably hard to see. Um, that's a false positive rate. Uh, so you know, having a bunch of false positives, not a good thing. Um, true positive rate is on the y-axis. Uh, that mapping is uh, usually called an ROC curve. Uh, and it's uh, very common for you to try to maximize that to be as far left and as far high as you can get. Uh, and the AUC just means area under the curve. And that's kind of what's the, what's the total um, area in the, the valid good uh, measure. Um, the other measures that you see is accuracy, recall, and precision. Um, accuracy, 
uh, as, as we looked at, kind of correlates here to the, um, the AUC. Uh, recall is about false positives and reducing those, and then precision is, is as, it would, as it would seem. The one thing to say about measures, it's always good on the, the accuracy, recall, and precision to get those numbers up, unless you need to tune for something specific. So uh, in this uh, example, there's a really problematic false positives here at the top. In order for me to get to the true positives at just over 80%, I'm at 20% false positives. And if I have 20% false positives, and uh, let's say I am trying to detect, detect fraud in some customer um, credit scenario, I, I, I'd be turning away 20% of my customers. And that's just not, that's just not acceptable. Um, so you may, be tune, you may tune for one uh, element in your, uh, in your models and actually reduce some of the other um, uh, some of the other measures, and that's okay if that's that's what you need to do. So we went through and we played with um, many different algorithms and, and models to try to play with this. Those four are what um, what we ended up tuning to, and at, by the end of it, so this is all our models together, uh, and the uh, measures on the left side are just the the model four, that last model, and you can see that we were able to get our uh, our measures up uh, fairly well. Uh, it would be interesting to then play with uh, further tuning, but it was an interesting example of how adding connected features actually increased uh, our predictive nature. And I'll say the other, the other thing that's interesting is, as I've looked at some of the research in this, um, adding only relational or connected features uh, isn't as predictive as mixing things. Um, I can't quite tell you why that is, uh, but it's not as, um, as I've said to other folks, we're not telling you you should replace what you currently do, but add to it, because it seems that together, uh, actually you get, you get better results. Um, the other thing that you'll wanna do is actually kind of say what features were most influential to, um, to the model and how do I tune to those features. So um, Random Force uh, actually has a, a way to do ratings on influence of features, rankings actually um, against each other. And so you can see here that common authors, that's over there on the left, uh, and Louvain, which is a community detection algorithm, uh, actually were very influential uh, we've got a couple other community detection ones and um, then some others that aren't as predictive here on the, uh, on the right. Now, it would be interesting, the, what we didn't do is test pulling certain ones out. That would change rankings. Uh, maybe actually even pulling some of the more influential ones out and kind of see what, what happens as well. Um, so the rankings are in comparison to each other. It's good to do your tuning and, and play around with different options. I mentioned try page rank here, um, but forgot to tell you why you want to try page rank. Um, the other thing you can do when you're looking at what's most influential in my model is actually use the page rank algorithm to look at influence of, uh, of, your, of the features in your model as well. So another way to take a look at that and, uh, and play around. So. Oh, and I did include a slide on that. Um, so the reason why you would want to tune that and look at influential features and not have too many features is that if you have a lot of features, what that can do is it can indicate and it can train your models to be very highly tuned to your, your tests and your trains uh, data set, your testing data set. And if you do that, um, it's basically, it's called overfitting. That means it's harder to uh, use your models in other scenarios. So your model will work really well. Oh my God, you, you, know, you have 99% accuracy when you run it on your um, training. And then when you take it out there in the real world, it, it just doesn't work. Um, so to avoid that, you wanna minimize features that aren't important. Uh, so looking at features, looking at um, the influence of them is, is definitely something you wanna do as you step through your models. Okay, so, so the other question is, okay, cool, what algorithms do I use? <laughs> and, I, and I know I said try them. We have many. We talked about, about them previously. Um, there are a lot of different algorithms you, you can try. I'm gonna give you a sampling of a few, talk through a few uh, that, that, see, that come up over and over again in the literature and that we've also seen as, as very predictive in general. Uh, community detection is one of those that is, um, is as a category, is very predictive. 
Um, triangles and clustering coefficient are, uh, are to me, uh, surprisingly uh, predictive just because they're very simple. Uh, but they actually measure something very interesting. So triangles, if we're thinking about triangle for you here, it's just a count. How many triangles does you have? A clustering coefficient is a, basically a probability that looks at how, how likely is it the neighbors of you are to already be connected. Um, so that's, you know, that's what that measures. Uh, if you're not doing machine learning, people actually globalize this across the total data set to look at uh, structures like small world effects and um, kind of power law aspects. So they look at it to kind of analyze their network in general. If you're looking at it for machine learning, uh, maybe you're trying to understand the tightness of certain groups, maybe the probability of links. So um, that was something that we found was predictive of future links. Uh, label propagation, um, I really enjoy this algorithm. Um, it's easy uh, to get up, it's easy to use, uh, it scales really well, um, and the, it's pretty easy to understand. It basically adopts the labels based on the neighbors, like what, um, which labels, and a label, I should say, is just a marker. It doesn't really have meaning. Uh, it's just an association with, um, you know, a way to look at a particular node, a classification. Uh, and it basically adopts the most in their network, including weights, including weights on nodes, relationships, both of them. Uh, and it does this uh, until it either uh, comes, uh, until it completes, or you set an iteration limit on it, which uh, I always suggest an iteration limit, so uh, you have kind of a known comparison. Uh, it does scale really well uh, for machine learning, group membership, classification. What group are, are these nodes in? It's really good for a first level analysis. Um, Louvain modularity, which I mentioned earlier this morning, um, does more fine grain uh, groups. So uh, actually in the model that we did in that link prediction, we actually used both. And they were both fairly predictive. Uh, Louvain was actually more predictive. So um, that was kind of an interesting result. So uh, that is an interesting algorithm. Uh, PageRank, I just had to mention PageRank. We didn't actually use it in this scenario. I just felt like if I, if I didn't mention PageRank when I was talking about algorithms, people would be upset with me. <laughs> um, uh, but the other thing is PageRank is highly predictive in uh, particular data sets, especially when you have directional relationships. Um, when you're thinking about PageRank, it's about broad influence over your network, but not necessarily direct influence. And so my analogy there is, is golfing with the CEO. So perhaps you work at a large company, you've got a lot of friends, maybe you're middle management, um, you know, you're not super high up, uh, and you have a friend who's kind of same scenario, middle level management, not super high up, lots of friends, but you golf with the CEO. Who has more influence at that company, you or your coworker? That's the concept, is having the ear or gaining the credibility from uh, a very influential node increases your score. In a graph machine learning sense, we actually do see this one used a lot in uh, machine learning. Uh, you can score on top influencers. What are my top 10 influencers? Um, you can rank uh, based on that as well, and you can also do contextual ranking as well, and that's usually done with personalized page rank. So it was an interesting study where they were looking for fraud, insurance fraud, uh, in particular with opioids, which is a very serious topic. And they were using personalized page rank to look to page rank some of the, um, the interactions between doctors and, uh, and pharmacies, so frequency of prescriptions and things of that nature, um, but then also do it by discipline. So you would imagine within a discipline of, you know, maybe an oncologist, maybe they do prescribe a lot of opioids, but maybe within a discipline of an optometrist, that would be perhaps unusual. So you might have a higher page rank in that discipline, but overall, you might get, you might get lost if, um, if you didn't contextualize it. A uh, jacquard similarity, uh, we see this a lot uh, in link prediction in particular. Uh, it's pretty simple. You're, you're measuring the union um, of, uh, of a set over, over the total. So it's just a proportional 
um, of similarities between the nodes, usually based on some kind of attribute or, or property. Uh, for machine learning, you can use this to represent similarity in, in general. Like, how, what, are, what nodes in the network are extremely similar to each other, and I'm gonna score that, or what nodes are extremely similar to the seed profile uh, that I wanna compare against. Maybe it's, a, again, a fraud profile, and how similar are you to the attributes of this profile? Uh, it's used a lot in, uh, in link prediction. Preferential attachment is a link prediction algorithm. Um, it measures closeness by measuring the connections or measuring by multiplying the connections between two nodes. And the idea here is, uh, is goes back to network science. Network science has a concept called preferential attachment. And the idea with that is the rich get richer. And they, we actually don't know why that tends to happen. There are a lot of theories about that. But the idea is if my network is really large and there's another node coming into the, over network, the overall graph itself, that new node is more likely to bump into me because I have a large surface area um, than to somebody with a, a smaller surface area. Uh, for graph perspective, just the probability of re relationships forming. Uh, the other link prediction that we see a lot is common neighbors. Um, so that's just looking on, looks at the potential triangles. So it's triadic closure. So the idea with this algorithm or the intuition with this is that if you have two strangers that never met, but they happen to have quite a few friends in common, what's going to happen? They're going to get introduced sometime. At some point, they will get introduced. That's, that's the concept with common neighbors. There's an interesting variation that I kind of find fun. It's called, it's weighted common neighbors or, or um, officially called Adamic Adar. Uh, that actually weights unusual similarities higher. And the example with that is if, if I said I want to guess similarities based on how many people here like Game of Thrones because I like Game of Thrones. Is that really predictive that we would know each other? Probably not. But if I was a fan of 17th century poetry, and somebody else here was a fan of 17th century poetry, we might be more likely to meet. So it weights those uncommon, um, those unique uh, similarities higher. And again, we're looking here at the probability of relationships. And I should note, I don't know if you, how well you guys can see that at the bottom. These illustrations are from a post by beamazed.com. Uh, it's a really good post on link prediction and some of the theory and philosophy behind it. Uh, if you're interested in, in that, I would recommend that, that post because they just do an excellent job of explaining it in detail. So now we get to the fun part. <laughs> and I'll go through uh, a couple examples. Um, but before I do that, just to explain what I'm going to do, uh, we're looking at Game of Thrones because it's, you know, we're in the middle of it. Why not? Um, we, have, we actually have a couple Game of Thrones data sets uh, for people to take a look at. There's ones based on the books, uh, and then there's ones, ba ones based on the um, TV series. Uh, we're looking at the one based on this TV series today because it's fun, uh, and that's based on uh, Andrew Beveridge's script to graph uh, work. And basically what uh, he did, and I had somebody at the break say, I think he did it by hand. I hope he didn't do it by hand. Um, but but the, he went and looked at basically the scripts and said if there's a name that is a couple nodes within X nodes to another name, there's a relationship, there's an interaction. And he goes, you know, goes through the scripts and, and does these interactions. Um, so it's an interesting method and it's surprisingly, uh, surprisingly matching what actually happens, actually, which is why it's so fun. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a demo with Neo4j desktop. Uh, and and uh, the algorithms and something we're called a playground. I'm just curious, um, how many people have played with uh, Neo4j desktop? Oh, fantastic, okay, great. Um, and how many of you that did that, or how many in the audience are developers? Fantastic, okay, good. Well, I can whip through some of this. So if you already have desktop, you wanna make sure, if you haven't already, um, to add in, oh, two things. You wanna make sure the graph algorithms plugin is in and have that, and then there's this new little thingy, and this is both terribly fun and dangerous. So we have our uh, graph algorithms playground, affectionately, internally, also known as Neuler, and Euler, if you get that. 
Um, it's an app, it's a visual app that our labs team has done. And if you know our labs team also by developer relations, uh, that this is something that's still experimental, but you can download it today if you want to play, just it is experimental. You can go to install.graphapp.io and play with this later. Um, we even include some of the same um, uh, data that we're going to be looking at today. So with that, um, I think our tech team's going to bring me over to a uh, demo here. And we'll get started as soon as I can remember what my password was. It's impossible to see the caps lock button on here with all the light. <laughs> so, excuse me, guys. Ah, I love our support team. Sorry, folks, I am just having a terrible time getting my computer unlocked. All right, I'm gonna give up on my computer, which is really sad, because I had live demo. Hmm. I bet if I was sitting at my desk at home, I could do this. I was a good citizen and I reset my password <laughs> and I was doing the old password. Nothing like being nervous in front of a group and then trying to remember your password and remember your password from a month ago. So anyhow, I think we're ready now. Thank you for your patience. This is what live demos are like. Uh, so hopefully that's it. Um, but it is experimental. So yeah, there you go. Um, all right. So this is the desktop that you're familiar with. Uh, th once you launch the Graph Algorithms Playground, you come to a, a screen that uh, I believe you should be able to, to see up here. Yep, great. Uh, and you have a home screen. You've got the different types of algorithms you can take a look at, uh, centralities, community detection, pathfinding, similarities. We don't have all of them in there yet. This is experimental. This is something we're playing with. And if you do play with this, we want your feedback. Uh, we want to hear about how you want to use it and uh, what, uh, what other things we might be missing in it. 
Um, so let's take a look at triangles. Um, that was an interesting one. So if we look at triangles, let's go ahead. I'm in Louvain here. Let's uh, the here at the very top are the different algorithms. On the left will be the categories when you get into it. So let's look at triangle count. And our uh, label is going to be characters, because Game of Thrones, we want to look at uh, characters. And let's say, I don't know, season two. Does anybody remember season two? Let's go, let's go season five. <laughs> let's not make it hard. OK, and then we're going to, and you can see here, I hope fairly well, yeah, you can see here where you select the different seasons, the different characters, or the different um, uh, labels, if we had different relationships and different um, labels, you could look at them here. You can also set your parameters here, which is, which is kind of fun. And then you hit the Run button, and you end up with um, the results. So let's take a look. Uh, Cersei, oh, interesting. Cersei in Season 5 uh, had 75 triangles and, oh, but only a coefficient of 0.17. So what that means is that Cersei has a lot of triangles in her network, but people who are connected to her are less likely to be connected to each other. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but it looks like Stannis has fewer triangles, but his neighbors are more likely to be connected. So interesting, interesting bit of information. Kind of you can explore and play with your, your data this way. And let's look, at, um, let's look at label propagation. That's always fun. So label propagation, season two. We'll go back in time a little bit here. We're going to run that. OK, that runs pretty quick. The communities that label propagation gives you back here, those numbers don't mean anything. They're just a label. And that's always something to keep in mind. But we can see, oh, one, uh, 157 or 154, 154. Yeah, so we have some common um, labels. But it's not very satisfying. So let's actually look at what that might, uh, uh, might, that might visualize. This takes a minute to kind of go through and complete, but we can see, OK, well, we're going to do node size is uh, label propagation, node color is uh, label propagation. But we have this weird node out, or this weird isolated group going on in this upper right-hand corner. And so if we try to zoom in on it, whoa, really zoom in it, see that's Daenerys. And if you remember from season two, I think they were kind of off on their own little area, their own little island, so to speak. Um, so it's kind of interesting, and you can kind of visually explore it, or you can explore it through, um, through the, the tables um, itself. So let's take a look. What's another fun one? Let's take a look at page rank. So let's do page rank. Let's do something early and then do something late. So let's look at page rank in season one. So page rank, remember, we're looking for the most influential, uh, not necessarily directly, but broad influence over a network. And with this one, let's see, node color. Let's go with the node color for label propagation, because I think community node color is more interesting when you're looking at colors. And then I have to refresh. So I have to redraw it, and we can kind of look at uh, page rank, try to intuit something. And we can see for season one, it looks like uh, Tyrion has a, a reasonably high page rank. Um, some of the other ones as well. Uh, another way to look at this, so visually this is very fun, and it's fun to wiggle things around and impress people with, with uh, your knowledge about uh, Game of Thrones. Um, but another way to look at this is just a simple chart. I actually find for page rank is the easiest way for me to, to get the information. So Tyrion had a really high uh, page rank in season one. Um, let's see what happens by season six. I'm going to run this. Uh, one, one, Sansa. You know, the interesting thing, I played with this data a little bit, and Sansa uh, is never too far. Yeah, here she is coming down in, um, not too far from the top. So page rank, she, she always seems to have a, a reasonable page rank. She always has a reasonable amount of influence. So I'll run one more. I know we're, we're trying to get back on time a little bit. I'm going to run one more that I really enjoy um, between is centrality. We're going to look at, uh, and I'll explain what that is as well. So between is centrality looks at the nodes with more shortest paths through it. So how, uh, how many paths go through that node? Uh, and what that actually shows you 
is that shows you um, who are bridges between groups. And so with this data set, I kind of like between this um, to take a look at, and anything like this, is to kind of take a look at who um, might be a good person to uh, help uh, with a, uh, a peace fire or help be a negotiator between groups. And so in season one, this is probably not going to be very surprising, if I can scroll it. Yeah, with season one, it looks like Ned. So Ned didn't make it, but in, in season one, he would have been a good person if you were trying to broker a peace between two groups. So I just wanted to show you this because it's, it's a lot of fun. We're still working on it. We're, it's experimental, but it gives you a sense of what you might be able to do with, um, with some of the graph algorithms, um, play with them. You can see how some of these things might be influential. You might look at them over different graphs like we just did. Um, we definitely know. I've run this same algorithm, uh, I think, on season five and on, and Jon Snow is always the peacemaker. <laughs> Uh, after after five or six, something like that, he comes up as the um, the highest potential for uh, for brokering for being a bridge. Um, so that's that's it for for this demo. If you're interested in uh, finding out more information about link prediction, diving deeper into that workflow, um, definitely take a look in the book. It's basically chapter eight in you know, in summary here. Uh, and then if you want to play around with some of the cool apps, uh, definitely take a look at uh, some of those and play around with these and, and let us know what you think. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for being patient through the demo, uh, uh, Carbuncle, on the, on the password. Really appreciate it. Um, we'll see you uh, later. And I believe the next speaker will be on shortly.